Hello, everybody. If you've joined on, you're a little early. We are going to uh, wait till 10. Hope everybody's having a great day. We're gonna give some folks time to get in. We had about 130 people register. All right, folks, welcome. We're going to give it a couple more minutes before we start. Got about 130 people registered. And as typical tourism people, they're slowly trickling in. Hope everybody's having a great morning. We should have had some music planned.
All right, people are rolling in. We're gonna give it about one more minute. Welcome everybody. This is the first of our mid-year marketing updates that unfortunately we are doing virtually this year. Let's hope this is the last virtual event we will do. We have about 130 people scheduled for this. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A and ask some questions. We will answer them at the end. We got a lot of ground to cover. You can also use the chat. Morning to everybody. But if you really have questions, the Q&A is the best way to go. We're gonna give about one more minute and then we'll get rolling. All right, if there was one thing Lynn Minges taught me in my time with her is that uh, you got to start on time or everybody will show up even later. So we're going to get rolling. Welcome, everybody. This is our first of our mid-year marketing updates. We're going to do probably about three of these virtually uh, over the next three months just to cover everything that's going on in the program. Um, thanks for all your participation and everything. I've uh, got some great uh, panelists today with me. Uh, Allison Schultz, who's our marketing director, and Marlise Taylor is our research director. We're going to talk about what's going on in the state. We're going to talk about a lot of the uh, how our campaign's going, what's happening with that. We're also going to cover uh, what's going on with grants that are out there in the marketplace right now that you may have heard about. Um, we're going to cover all this stuff, then we'll do Q&A at the end. Please submit your Q&A into the Q&A. Uh, you can chat in the chat, but uh, we're going to look to the Q&A for, for really any questions that need to be answered. So make sure you're, you're dropping those in there. Okay, I'm going to get going. All right, so welcome to our update. Uh, we're going to start first with some traveler mindset research. As many of you know, we've been doing this through Destination Analyst uh, weekly now for, for, gee, almost a year and a half. Uh, it's been really providing great insight to where the where the, where the frame of mind our, our visitors are in uh, and how we can talk to them. We've shown you this chart uh, probably every time we've done a webinar. Um, this is really important. This is expectations, uh, whether things are going to get better or worse. Uh, getting better is in the blue uh, line and getting worse is in the orange line. Uh, you know, back in uh, the spring, we had finally crossed to where people thought it was going to get better rather than worse because of the vaccines coming out. Uh, we've seen a tremendous uh, change in that perception uh, over the last three weeks, four weeks, due to the Delta variant um, breakthrough cases and things like that and extensive media coverage of that. Um, so, so kind of my theme here for what we're seeing from the traveler mindset is going to be, it's not great, but it's not terrible, right? So we've lost a lot of the ground that we made, uh, and that's not what we want to see, and there's a lot of pessimism out there, but I will say there is still optimism. Uh, this chart shows uh, at this moment, they asked, how safe would you feel doing any type of travel activity? Uh, and it took us a heck of a long time to get to where people felt more safe than unsafe. They still feel more safe than unsafe. Although, as you can see, that gap is, is narrowing. Uh, we need to do everything we can to keep that to where they feel safe uh, rather than unsafe and do everything we can. Uh, when they asked how many people have canceled trips due to this Delta variant, 23%. Uh, uh, that number is rising. It was about 19% the last time they, they asked it. And once you get up to about a quarter of the people uh, canceling trips, that's, you know, we're, we're starting to see a sizable impact. So we need to watch out for that. This has become a very important issue for us when it comes to visitor mindset and visitor perception. But it's not terrible. When we've asked people at, if if they think uh, how close we are to getting back to the normal uh, of leisure travel activities, these three bars are the last three weeks. Uh, this week, uh, this last week, two weeks ago, um, three weeks ago, 
stack. So you can see we're losing ground. Uh, we went from uh, from about 32% of the people thinking we were essentially pretty much back down to 25%. But as you can also see, uh, you know, it hasn't really bottomed out. There's still the majority of the people think, okay, we're getting there. Um, so while this is bad, it's not terrible uh, for everyone. It's another stat. So how confident are you that you can travel safely? People are still more confident that they can travel safely than not confident. Although we've lost a lot of that confidence, we need to do everything we can to support it. Um, and the state of mind, I think is still pretty good. If you look at this, we've lost the least amount of data on this. These are people that are ready to travel as opposed to people who aren't ready to travel. So even though they may not be as confident as they were, many of them are still ready to travel. That's a really great sign for us moving forward. We need to keep that there, right there where it is. And why is this happening? Well, to me, it's really a focus on the media coverage. Uh, this study just came out in Forbes. Uh, it was a Harris poll. 72% uh, of Americans said they're checking the case numbers and infection rates for destinations. Um, they're aware of it. They're checking. Are they going to the CDC site? I don't think so. It seems to me the way they're checking is they're checking in the media. They're seeing who the media is covering as hotspots. And more than half said they're going to postpone the trip um, or cancel it if they don't think it's good. And nine out of 10, they say they've heard a lot about surges because of the Delta variant. But what's really interesting is when asked further in the Harris poll, most people identified places like Florida that had generated a lot of media coverage and had high rates. And they didn't mention a place like Louisiana, which has just about as high rates as Florida, but hasn't gotten the national media coverage. So to me, that shows that it's really a media issue. So what we need to do is take every step we can to make sure that we don't get into the media coverage of having outbreaks or being a hotspot. That's gonna be really beneficial for us moving forward. How are we doing so far? Well, you look at this uh, a question about how people on their most recent trips, how close to normal they felt activities were. Restaurants, hotels are doing a great job, attractions. Uh, and then you get to events and airports and airlines, things where, where people are really having that heavy interaction. Uh, there's still mask requirements, those kind of things. Then you get lower um, lower percents of, of feeling like it's back to normalcy. I think this is a more important question is, is uh, how, are, how is the tourism industry providing our service? Are we doing it or are we having trouble? Obviously we all know we have staffing shortages and that's really affecting uh, business, but is it impacting the perception of our destinations from travelers? Right now I'd say it's a, it's a wash. Uh, some people say they're doing a, a good job, not as many as were but also uh, not as many are saying it's doing a bad job. So I think it's pretty neutral on this point. Uh, we need to keep moving forward with it. When we really talked about the traveler mindset, essentially remember back in 2020, people were scared. They were scared to travel. They were hesitant, cautious. Um, then we got to 21, 21, we had the vaccines, people got vaccinated and they were psyched. They were excited, it was time to go. Um, uh, what we've seen now is that we've kind of pulled back into this middle ground of caution. Uh, everybody is still excited, but they're also getting more scared. Um, so what we need to do is keep the focus on what we're doing that's right. We need to get people vaccinated. We need to stay out of the media for the negative things. And we need to keep focusing on inspiring people to get out and travel. That's really important to us. So how has the state done? Uh, well, for that, we've got Marlies Taylors here to give you kind of some insight on what the state looks like as far as our uh, visitation and how things are going. I had a lot of people ask me about this. I've never seen as uneven a, a recovery as what we're having now. So I wanted to have Marlies uh, go over this with us. Marlies, please, you can start sharing your screen now. Thank you. Great. Hey, everybody. It's good to, see, well, I wouldn't say good to see you. It's nice to um, be with you uh, anyway. So let me just um, get jump right into how we're doing. We're collecting so much research now. It's so exciting to see um, so many different kinds of numbers, but it also um, is a little overwhelming. But I'm going to just try to, you know, to kind of boil it down to um, a handful of slides for you. Um, but first of all, let's look at, um, you know, what we're seeing this year in terms of visitation trends. I was, I'm really pleased 
with um, our most recent geolocation data that is showing um, those out-of-state visitors are continuing to um, come back to North Carolina. So this represents year-to-date data for um, 2021, out-of-state visitors, 74%, in-state visitors, 26%. So this is even a little more positive than what we saw um, pre-COVID in terms of in-state versus out-of-state. If you recall, that's usually you know, around 30, 70, or, you know, 35, 65, something like that. So um, these are positive numbers. And I thought I would just throw in some in-state um, origin markets and out-of-state origin markets. Um, I think the out-of-state origin markets is pretty interesting because you'll see a couple of markets that we don't usually see in our top five. So this tells me that people are still really choosing destinations that they can drive to easily. So close by, um, you know, we usually see Columbia and Atlanta, um, but we don't see Charleston and Myrtle Beach in the top five um, really ever. So I think this is pretty interesting. Um, again, we're still working through this new geolocation data and some normalization of it. So you may see this change a little bit and this is just year to date, but just thought that that was kind of an interesting uh, view on who we're seeing in terms of those out of state markets. However, we're still seeing visitors from all over the US. So this is just a quick shot of, of where we're seeing visitors from uh, year to date. And I thought that was interesting, uh, you know, just a, a nice little visual to show you that we are still attracting visitors from all over the US. We're certainly seeing higher visitation this year. Uh, again, we're still working on, on that data, but let me jump into some lodging data here. Switching gears a little bit. So year to date, uh, commercial hotel motel room demand is up 33% from last year, but still down about 14% from 2019. And regionally, it's up significantly as well. You could see uh, Whit mentioned the uneven recovery, and certainly each of the economic development regions or prosperity zones are seeing nice recovery. The Western region, particularly, demand is up 70% from the same time period last year and only down one and a half percent from the same time period in 2019. So um, that is really, you know, super positive in, in, in my mind um, that, you know, they're almost back to 2019 levels because we know that the hotels and motels have really struggled um, in recovery. So yay. Um, but you can see there on the right, the percent change from year to date um, 2020 to year to date 21. Um, so positive all around, um, but a little uneven as Whit mentioned. So we also get data from um, home rentals. So shared economy, um, home away, uh, Airbnb, um, those type of um, shared economy platforms. So room nights, well, I'm, I won't say room nights, home rental nights um, sold statewide year to date um, are about 8.8 .8 million, which is up 36% from 2020 um, and about 853 million in room revenues, which is up 47% from 2020. Again, um, you could see some uneven um, numbers there, but I think this shows that people are still choosing this type of um, accommodation. So we need to be prepared for that really to continue on, I think that this is really gonna shift our lodging landscape. So we need to pay close attention. Um, similar to vacation rentals, you know, most of the shared economy rentals are found along the coast and the mountains. So um, regions in the Piedmont are still doing well, but you will see some of the higher um, growth along the um, coast and mountains. The Sand Hill actually, Sand Hills region uh, demand is up 78%. So again, there's, um, some new numbers there coming out that 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 type of platform is working well in the you know, um, non-coast, non-mountain regions as well. And then we also get data um, just on those traditional vacation rentals. So again, these are really focused along the coast and, and, and some in the mountains. So you only see four regions here, but year to date demand for these vacation rentals is up 69% statewide and up 57% from 2019. So, you know, we've even um, gone above and beyond 2019 numbers in terms of this type of accommodation demand. So um, again, this is a new landscape for us and we're gonna have to, to um, keep up with it. And you could see there on the right, the different um, 
regions and how they're faring in terms of um, demand for those home rentals. From our quarterly STR forecast, now this is just commercial um, hotels and motels, but we just got this in um, just yesterday and just wanted to kind of show you where STR predicts we will be in terms of commercial lodging. So from this forecast report, demand this year is projected to be up 32% from 2020, but still down about eight and a half percent from 2019, which, you know, if I would have given you this report six months ago, um, it would have been a much different story. So you could see that that numbers are starting to take back up. 2022 demand is expected to top 2019 demand by about 4%. So this is really good news. Um, you know, back when we first started looking at the forecast, it was going to be past 2022, but now they are expecting um, numbers to continue to grow. There's another way of looking at this um, monthly, but I think it's a little messier. So I prefer that annual, um, you know, this seasonality here kind of um, makes this graph a little messier, but if you prefer to look at things monthly and then the dotted line shows the forecast um, versus the historical. So that is all I have to present today. But um, if you have any questions, of course you have my uh, contact and I'll be on for the rest of the webinar to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Marlies. As you can see, it, it is an uneven uh, recovery. Uh, we're seeing lots of uh, different situations in different areas, and I think we'll see different uh, aspects as we get into different seasons. The seasonality, I think, is going to play a big factor in it as well. Uh, but regardless of what's happening, it's our job to get people out there and inspire them to, to come back. And to do that, Allison's leading the team. Uh, with our campaign, Get Back to a Better Place. So Allison's going to go over uh, where that is and what's happening with the, the current marketing campaign. Welcome, Allison. Good morning. Let's see. All right, here we go. Um, well, as you know, it's been three months um, since I've been able to share with you uh, a marketing update. Um, we are thrilled. Uh, that the numbers are looking so positive for us, even though they are so uneven. You know, when we launched Get Back to a Better Place back in April, we knew that it was the perfect time for us to inspire travel again. Uh, I've got a robust update for you um, this morning uh, that I wanted to share. But before we jump into Get Back to a Better Place, I wanted to just mention a couple of things around count on me and see and safety, given that's been such a topic of conversation for us this morning. Um, as you know, this campaign was incredibly successful. Uh, the awareness that we were able to achieve across the state was 25%. You know, one in four residents knew and was aware of um, Count on Me NC, and it really impacted their behavior to uh, follow those safety protocols. Uh, we even saw that 68% of um, residents, you know, were avoiding large gatherings, and it really helped position us to be seen by even travelers, you know, across the country as a, a safe destination uh, for travel, and we have seen that in our research. What I did want to share with you about Count on Me NC today, though, is, uh, you know, our partners, NCRLA and NC State Extension, uh, had an agreement to uh, you know, create these training modules and provide them online. That agreement has come to terms. So if you were to go to the website, you will see that the training modules have been taken down, but we are keeping the site live. We are continuing to have safety messages and to keep our brand ambassador, uh, Sunny Strong. Uh, we are actually partnering a bit with DHHS, another partner uh, in the initiative, and we've moved more towards encouraging North Carolinians to get vaccinated. Uh, over the summer, we partnered with them in bringing summer back. Uh, we did a full campaign um, uh, across social. It was organic in nature. In addition, we went back to the Charlotte Motor Speedway, partnered with them again as we did last October, and with Richard Petty, making sure that um, North Carolinians knew that they could reserve their spot to get their shot. And that was quite successful, and we did that around the Coke 600. So you see Sonny here, you know, um, you will find him on countonmenc.org, and you can see to the right a mobile pop-up when you go to the site. We will continue to um, drive that message to increase vaccinations across the state with this program and with this website.
The other thing that we are doing to, um, to help DHHS is we want to elevate and celebrate film tourism and, and the season of Halloween in North Carolina. As you know, uh, there are quite a few uh, films that have been shot in our state uh, that are horror in nature. We have Halloween Kills, which will be premiering on October 15th, and then we have the Scream franchise in January. We thought it might be a fun way to help um, attract a younger audience audience, those that are more college age in nature who have been resistant uh, to getting the vaccine to create just an experience, an immersive experience that if they are vaccinated, they could potentially wind up in a private screening for Halloween kills or some um, red carpet experiences. We are currently in concepting to have across North Carolina um, some um, theater takeovers, uh, concession takeovers with you know gift bags, branded cups, popcorn buckets. Um, we're gonna have a big sweepstakes around um, the winner receiving a behind the scenes tour of films that are shot across North Carolina. This whole uh, event is really highly targeted and it is across multi-channels digitally. So as it comes together, we'll be excited to share out um, uh, this particular activation and to help DHHS get more North Carolinians vaccinated in the coming months. So I want to jump right back and to get back to a better place. As you know, we launched this campaign in April um, and I unveiled it during our Visit NC 365 conference. You know, it's all about um, when travelers return to North Carolina um, to rediscover their memories, they actually return to a better version of themselves. Uh, the objective of this campaign is really to inspire visitation to North Carolina among travelers in our core markets. So we've gone back to those core markets out of state uh, that Marlies was sharing with you today. And we're focusing on just helping them rediscover our brand, those richer experiences that they know and love and can find in North Carolina. So the parameters of uh, the, the campaign and for this media always inspire drive visitation. Uh, our KPIs that we're following really closely is that arrival lift and we're seeing some positive momentum there. The total budget for this campaign specific to get back to a better place is just over 4.7 million. As I mentioned, we launched in the middle of April. We will go through the end of the year and then begin working on a new iteration for First That Last. Our target geographical markets, it's that footprint that you know and recognize. Uh, you can see here, and again, the target audience are bold travelers and those re-emerging um, travelers who are just willing to travel. And we've done, I think, a very effective job of that, uh, given just the volatile nature and disruptive nature right now in the market and with uh, consumers. This slide here is just to show that it is multi-channel. Uh, for the most part, it is digital, even with our television spots. We, of course, will have some brand partnerships and some print involved with it as well. Um, but I know it's been a while really since we've had the opportunity to uh, see the 30 second spot. I thought I would um, air it again for you today to see. As you know, it just um, really taps into the restorative nature and the transformation of travel, uh, especially a trip to North Carolina. And it really speaks to both the mental and the physical transformation that um, this father and son has. Honestly, I already feel like I'm in a better place just watching that spot again. Um, another thing that I wanted to share with you is our paid social. Um, share some of the new creative that we have. We have done um, a lot of work in optimizing our spots. Um, as you may recall, you know, the lion's share of our budget is towards that 
30 second spot and the 15 second cut downs. But across social, you know, our paid social effort is the second highest ranking in spend. And we really need for this to perform for us. So we've optimized um, our creative and we're seeing that we're getting stronger um, ad recall for our effort in addition to helping us drive that travel intent, uh, intent across the platforms. So here are some spots that we have running on Facebook and Instagram, and then we've got a separate campaign running on Pinterest. So on the first one here, uh, it says after the year you've had, you just, uh, you don't just need this, you deserve this. Visit North Carolina and get back to a better place. And you can see the creative, we really want it to move to really capture the imagination uh, of the users who are engaging with the spot. You'll see that, you know, throughout the course of the three. And the second one says, say goodbye to hibernation and hello to trips that transform. Visit North Carolina and get back to a better place. This one here, as you will recognize, is very similar to our video spot. And the third one is a take on our, um, our print, our interactive print, and focuses in uh, obviously on the coast. Reconnect with your favorite people and your vacation days. Again, visit North Carolina and get back to a better place. Wanted to show again our uh, print component that goes along uh, with our partner co-op. Um, and we've um, we placed probably, I would say, minimal print with this, um, with this campaign, but we're going to see more as we get into uh, the fall co-op placements. All right, now I want to jump in and uh, share with you uh, performance to date for Get Back to a Better Place. Uh, we have generated uh, nearly 415 million total impressions across all of our channels. Uh, when you looked at that 30 second spot, we end with the 15 second cut downs. We have generated over 111 million video, uh, video impressions that are performing very, very well. Uh, paid social is uh, pushing at 280 million. And then obviously we have had paid search throughout the course of the year and we have over 3.6 million uh, that's really driving uh, to uh, visitnc.com to the trips that transform that really supports this campaign. And then the digital display is as pushing 20 million today. So what does that mean for us? Well, we're looking at 104% of our forecasting trend on arrival, so very, very strong. That spot that I just played for you is getting a 97% completion rate. It is 11% above the benchmark, so it's really resonating with travelers. Um, our display is also 21% above that benchmark at 1.27%. Uh, when you look at YouTube, always a strong channel for us, and it's where you can actually find um, if you want to see that commercial, you can find it on our YouTube channel, 77% uh, completion rate on that as well. And so again, I had already mentioned that Facebook Instagram story, uh, what we are doing across our paid channels is uh, participating in a recall study uh, with both Facebook and Instagram, and again with Pinterest. And what we are seeing is our uh, recall for our ads is growing stronger and stronger and getting really close to that 30% benchmark. As I mentioned, everything that we are doing with this campaign is driving to trips that transform. Um, and we're getting some really strong engagement from travelers. The articles that we actually created for this was based on how consumers and travelers and visitors were currently searching when they wanted to come into North Carolina. We have created nine articles to date covering all 14 subregions on our website, more than 100 locations, attractions, and accommodations are featured across these articles, really pushing down um, links to your pages, to your websites, and to your partners. And to date, that number stands at over 53,000 downstream clicks. So we're excited about that. 
The other thing that I wanted to mention as I wrap up the marketing update is, you know, our partner co-op program. Several of those are actually sold out. Uh, if you have interest in um, working with us, we would love for you um, to, to contact uh, Brooks Luquire, uh, anyone from our team, Haley Weddington. It would be great to get you engaged in this program. There are 42 opportunities. The savings here are over 76%. Um, and again, it's across all you know marketing disciplines. Very excited that, um, as you might recall, that we have uh, opportunities for our Outdoor NC Alliance members, as well as um, our certified retirement community partners for Retire NC. To date, we have 35 partners participating with us, um, and it includes 21 Tier 1 and Tier 2 partners, which is important, and it represents, seems pushing close to $600,000 in commitments. It represents all of our regions, and we're hoping that you will join in. Um, for some of those uh, opportunities that are sold out, the agency is looking to see if we might be able to uh, expand that inventory so that other partners on a wait list could participate um, and get into the program. I wanted to jump over and just give you a very quick uh, update on public relations. Our public relations team has been really busy this year and putting together a great program of work. Good news is we are going to have some in-person media missions. I mean, obviously our fingers are crossed given what's going on with the Delta variant and how both um, journalists and media and consumers overall are responding to that. But we do have an in-state media mission in Raleigh on October 19th, we are targeting both in-state and national media. Uh, the event is going to take place at um, the really elegant Heights House in Raleigh. Uh, the deadline to participate is just around the corner on August 18th. So if you have any interest in joining us for that, please reach out to Margot Metzger uh, on our team and you can see uh, her email here down below. The other thing that we have that's occurring later this month is a wine country fam tour. It's gonna to feature Winston-Salem, Dobson and Wilkesboro. And we've got a number of media outlets participating with us with Food and Wine, Trip Savvy, Winetraveler.com, Forbes and Huffington Post. I like to always shine the light on coverage that we've been able um, to generate uh, for our partners. We're really excited um, to share this one with you that was placed in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was for our partner, um, Charlotte, the US National Whitewater Center. And the story was five outdoor adventure vacations inspired by the Olympics. And uh, the Wall Street Journal has over 32.9 unique uh, visitors per month. Uh, another placement we wanted to share, which is in Forbes.com, is for Greenfield Lake Park in Wilmington. Uh, part of a story discovered these scenic hiking and walking trails. As you know, uh, being outdoors is one of the number one activities travelers are participating in, especially coming out of this pandemic. Another placement is for Brevard in Transylvania County um, in a section around the 15 best small towns to visit in 2021. Couldn't agree more. Uh, this appeared in the SmithsonianMagazine.com and it has 2.8 million unique visitors per month. So that is my presentation, uh, Wit. I know that you want to jump over and talk a bit about grants and how uh, North Carolina may benefit. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Allison? First, I'm going to continue to talk about uh, our positives and some of the rewards we're seeing and some of the awards uh, and the great work we've done from the team. I am really proud of what the team's been able to accomplish this year and throughout the pandemic. Uh, as I'm sure you're all challenged, we are too, and our team has just done, done everything they can to help the state. So we're really thrilled with the uh, with the, um, the Count on the NC campaign, as Allison had talked about earlier. Um, you know, that was a public safety campaign um, where we thought the focus should not be inspiration, but should be health, doing the right thing and, and establishing North Carolina as a reputation of a place that's not going to have a big outbreak, that's going to do things the right way, that's going to take care of people when they travel to make them feel safe. Uh, that has really resonated. Uh, the uh, Count on Me campaign won about 18 local and regional advertising awards, and it also won a national uh, OB from the Out of Home Advertising 
Association out of one of uh, 37 finalists. Um, and it's also uh, still up for several awards. Uh, one of which I'm really excited about. Uh, we'll go to ESCO uh, for next week. Uh, and that's the US travel. Uh, we have the Mercury Awards, the highest awards that State Tourism Office can get. Uh, we are a finalist for an advocacy and grassroots campaign uh, for this campaign. Uh, wanted to say we are also eligible for what's called a People's Choice Award. And what that means is that all you guys can vote on that. So please uh, go to uh, esto.ustravel.org slash awards and you can vote on our campaign there. Uh, or you can just, uh, you know, Google search US Travel Mercury Awards. Uh, you're only about allowed to vote once on one Mercury Award. So if you like another state, don't bother going. If you like us, uh, go there and vote for us. Uh, you can only vote once per browser, uh, but vote as many as you can. Uh, we're excited about it. They also do the Destiny Awards for DMOs, and I know that Charlotte and uh, Asheville are also uh, nominated, uh, so you can vote for them as well. Uh, but we're really excited. Uh, this is really that whole core of, of programs we had, Count on Me, Cook It Forward, Outdoor NC, and Drive Through Vacations. Remember, we tried to take people through the path of, uh, of recovery to help them get back. So, we're really excited about that. Okay, now sit down and buckle your seatbelts because uh, we've talked about the fun stuff. Now I'm going to get into the math. Um, I'm going to talk about tourism funding, what's going on, what's out there uh, grant-wise, and, and what it looks like. As you all know, we were very fortunate to receive $15 million, uh, in CARES Act funding, uh, of which we were able to do a $5.5 million credit program for the DMOs. We also, thanks to NCTIA, uh, had a million and a half that we could do in a direct grant program last year from the CARES Act. Um, that, that has all basically gone past. So now what we're looking at this year is uh, really our funding. Then there's the second stimulus package, which is called ARPA. You'll hear about that a lot, A-R-P-A. Um, that's the stimulus package. And then there are also some EDA grants that are grants from the Economic Development Administration. Those are coming out of the ARPA. Um, stimulus program. So wanted to kind of lay the, lay the land of where we are budget-wise. So heading into this year, it looks like for the third straight year, our budget will remain at about $11.4 million. Um, uh, this is uh, essentially less than what we had uh, 20 years ago. We just struggled to, to be able to, to increase that budget. Now we have been able to get non-recurring uh, money through things like the CARES Act package, and that's helped us out. And that continues. We're really fortunate, thanks to the support from the legislature and all our partners. Uh, right now, currently in the House and the Senate budgets, uh, we are expected to receive $10 million a year for the next three years uh, from this ARPA federal grant. It's like the second stimulus package. It's the uh, second one they did after the CARES Act. Uh, so that would be $10 million that we could dedicate toward marketing uh, to help the, uh, the destination get along. We're going to need those funds because uh, it's really become the wild, wild west. Uh, I think uh, the federal response to this pandemic has been to, to unload funds, to release federal funds, and those funds are flowing everywhere. This is a look at the amount of money that state tourism offices potentially can receive over the next fiscal um, through their budgets, through the ARPA program, and through the EDA um, uh, stimulus package. If you're looking for us, we're down at the bottom. Um, we are barely above Georgia when it comes to straight up budget, uh, but Georgia surpasses us when uh, if they get what they receive uh, from the ARPA and from the EDA, uh, we will be one of the lowest uh, budgets in the state. Um, I think it's key to point out that uh, the final total column, which doesn't even include the EDA grants, and I'll get into why I didn't include the EDA grants later, but uh, those Final total, uh, it doesn't include a $300 million program that Virginia is doing for tourism. Now, about 250 million of that program is gonna go into small businesses uh, assistance for tourism businesses, but uh, and so it's not really advertising. And a lot of the EDA grants aren't specifically advertising, but that's still tourism money uh, that is flowing into these states other than ours. So uh, it's a very competitive landscape out there. Uh, and we're gonna have a hard time keeping up um, with them. And so we need to be clever in our marketing. We can't just out broadcast everyone. 
we're going to have to find better ways to do it better and smarter as we have for a long time. Um, okay, so uh, we, I want to talk about the EDA. This is the Economic Development Administration. Um, a lot of you have not dealt with them before. Uh, they do grants program. They're typically for businesses, for infrastructure. It's not usually marketing. Uh, many of you have heard about this program uh, from the EDA. There's a, a travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation grants, and they've divided it into two separate programs. One is a non-competitive grant that goes to every state, uh, and there was $510 million that were put into that. The other one is competitive grants, and there's $240 million for that. North Carolina's share of the $510 million was $6.4 million. Um, so you'll see it was based on loss. And since we, you know, we had pretty good numbers during, uh, during COVID, uh, our share of that turned out to be $6.4 million. So that kind of gives you an idea of the scope of the program. A lot of you have been asking me about the EDA uh, program. The best way to find out about it is to, to look at those webinars that I have listed below. And we'll make this presentation available um, after, the, after this uh, on, on partners.visitnc.com. If you can't do that, just look up EDA, ARPA, Travel, Tourism, Outdoor Rec Grants. You'll find it. That's a, a webinar that the EDA did last week that is really good. It's 45 minutes long, and it describes both of these grant programs. And, uh, and it's going to give you a better description than what I'm going to give you in the next five minutes. But um, those are the two EDA grants. So the non-competitive grant that, that states get, that goes to the governor's office. That's $6.4 million for North Carolina. That's at the governor's discretion as to how it will be spent. It can be used on marketing and promotion. I will tell you right now, chances are it will not be used on marketing and promotion. As typical with these EDA grants, they're gonna look more toward infrastructure projects. Uh, I know the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources for the state is already interested in trying to help uh, state parks and historic sites uh, with these funds. It's $6.4 million. It's going to be up to the governor. Um, so if you've got an opinion, uh, you know, talk to someone in the governor's office about how this should be spent. Um, my hope is that if it does go uh, to uh, cultural and natural resources, it'll go toward ways to integrating private businesses into the parks to maybe allow outfitters to be there, ways in which we can get private business in there. Because it's really trying to get long-term um, uh, progress and long-term added value into these uh, into these uh, campaigns. So we'll see. That is the non-competitive part. The governor is going to decide in the next 25 days where that goes. The competitive part. So that's 240 million dollars. So if you're thinking there's a ton of money out there, realize out of the 500 million dollar program, North Carolina was awarded six million dollars. This program is about half its size. I would imagine that. North Carolina's share of grant funding available is going to be about half that size, half the size of the 6.4 million. Um, this is part of the ARPA program. This is just another aspect of the ARPA program. So if you want to apply for these grants, you have to realize, uh, and you're getting ARPA money, you need to let the ARPA people know they can't go for the same thing as what you got that original ARPA grant money for. Um, this has to be a different project. I would also recommend that if you're applying for this, you do uh, try and do uh, infrastructure product development for this uh, because it is really about things that will support the economic development of the area and strategies. Uh, it's trying to get regions that have been impacted to do more things. So if you've got some kind of project where you've got some money for it, but you don't have all of it, this is a great way to complete that. If you need to buy a piece of property, if you wanna put in a canoe or a kayak spot, if you're trying to build a trail, those kind of things, I think it's very important. Okay, who's eligible for this EDA competitive grant? Uh, it's really just about any tourism office. It's also universities, uh, Indian tribes, uh, institutions of higher learning, that kind of thing. You will need to show that you have the support of a governmental entity, of a municipality, of a county, or of the state. You will need to show that. So if you are a chamber of commerce, or if you're not distinctly a part of government, you're gonna to have to show that the government is involved in this uh, and, and, and we'll do it. That's gonna be required of it. What are the eligible uses? Okay, I'm sorry to disappoint people. You cannot use this for local and regional tourism marketing and promotion. It's not eligible under the competitive grants. So if you wanna try and do a marketing campaign, 
You can't do it with that. You could do it with the non-competitive grants that the state gets, but the governor is going to decide how those are spent. Um, so once again, and the other, I think, key to this is that this is not a full out grant. It's typically 80-20. You provide 20% of the funding, EDA will provide 80% of the funding. So that's why I think it's really probably better for something that you've been trying to do, but maybe you don't have enough funds uh, to do. That would be really good for this program. Uh, you can actually do more. You can do a 50-50 match uh, and EDA will award this uh, you get points for how much of the match you are willing to put in. So if you've got a project where you've got 80% of the funds, but you don't have that final 20%, this is a great project for that. Um, that is the, the EDA uh, programs that they've talked about for tourism. A program that EDA has not talked about for tourism, but I think could also be beneficial for tourism, is something called the Build Back Better uh, Regional Challenge Grant. The reason I think this could be better for tourism is there's a billion dollars in this grant program. Uh, our EDPNC office with John Loyak and our team is going to be working on these. These are fairly complex, though. And what this is, is really it's about product development. It's about a regional connection. Uh, so what you're going to need is three to eight uh, projects that you can have this grant pay for that are connected. So if you say you wanted to connect three or four hiking trails, biking trails, canoe kayak trails, you needed to buy some land, you needed to put in a put in, uh, preferably multi-county, say if there's a regional area of the state that wants to connect some of their trails together, that type of thing is a great uh, program for this. These projects can total up to a hundred million dollars uh, to be eligible for this grant and there's a billion dollars in grant funding for this. So I think this is a really interesting grant to look at that some tourism entities should look at. If you're trying to buy a product, maybe you've got a, a building that you could buy and use as a, as a welcome center, as something like this. Uh, if you're trying to build maybe an esports facility uh, and you want to get that done or have the equipment in for an esports facility, it can't be a general community asset. So it can't be for a swimming pool that residents are going to use or a softball field that residents are going to use, unless you say this is a softball field, but uh, visitors are going to use it. We're going to use it for tournaments, those kind of things. It's a two-phase award. Uh, so what you do is first off, we'll apply for the award almost uh, in the next two months needs to be done. And if you pass that phase, you'll, we will get $500,000 to put together the package that will become the, the award for the three to eight projects that could be worth up to $100 million. So this is a big, big um, potential uh, you know, destination altering kind of uh, grant that's out there that I really think is a once in a lifetime opportunity for maybe some destination to, to get something done. If you have a lot of questions about it, you can ask me or you can go to the expert. Hillary Sherman is our contact. She works only North Carolina for the EDA. Uh, her email is the right there, hsherman at eda.gov. She is absolutely swamped right now. So do not call her, but send her an email. She's really great about getting back to people and sending them emails quickly. So, all right. I know it's it's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of challenges. It's a challenging time, but I really wanted to close on a good note. I pulled this from our destination analyst. Realize we've done a good job. People want to come to North Carolina. Uh, we are one of the top places that is the most desired uh, for visitors over the next 12 months. There are good things happening. We just need to keep them rolling, keep them going, and do everything we can to keep everyone safe and healthy so we can get back to doing what we do. Thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us. If there's any questions now, we'll take them in the Q&A or the chat. I know I went, I went over a lot of math there with the EDA grants. Uh, this presentation will be available on partners.visitnc.com under the COVID section. We should have it up this afternoon if you wanna go back. Thank you all for attending. If there's no questions, I'll give you another five seconds. If there's no questions, thank you, Marlies. Thank you, Allison. Thanks for everybody for doing such a great job. And we'll talk to you in about a month.